The year is 60 AD, at the northern edge of the Roman Empire. It has been 17 years since the Romans crossed the sea and invaded Britannia. Prasutagus, the chieftain of the Iceni tribe, has just passed away. He had been a friend and client king to Rome, and he was expected to bequeath his land to Rome upon death. But in his will, he announced that his wealth and territory was to be joint inherited by Nero, the sitting emperor of Rome, and his two daughters. He had hoped that this would secure his family with imperial protection. He was proven wrong. Imperial administrators ignored that part of his will, and seized all of Prasutagus's property and land. They publicly beat the widowed wife of Prasutagus, Boudicca, and her daughters were violated. The most illustrious of the Icenians were, by force, deprived of their positions. Prasutagus's land was seized as lawful plunder. After the plundering subsided, Boudicca grasped a spear to aid her in terrifying all beholders, and spoke as follows. You have learned by actual experience how different freedom is from slavery. Hence, although some among you may previously, through ignorance of which was better, have been deceived by the alluring promises of the Romans, yet now that you have tried both, you have learned how great a mistake you made in preferring an imported despotism to your ancestral mode of life. Cassius Dio describes Boudicca as such. She was very tall, in appearance most terrifying, in the glance of her eye most fierce, and her voice was harsh. The anti-Roman sentiment grew because of these atrocious acts. Even the neighbouring Trinovantes tribes joined the Iceni, and other tribes secretly sent men to aid the Iceni. The bulk of the Roman army was campaigning on the Isle of Mona, when news reached them that the Queen of the Iceni had revolted. The rebels' first target was Camulodunum a Roman colony founded by the military veterans who participated in the invasion of the island in 43 AD. It was a calculated target. The veterans there treated the native population with cruelty and oppression. The temple built in Camulodunum was another source of discontent. It was dedicated to Emperor Claudius, the man who initiated the conquest of Britain 17 years earlier. The temple was, as Tacitus writes, in the eye of the Britons, it seemed the citadel of eternal slavery. Camelodunum didn't have any fortifications, so it fell quickly to the rebels. But the temple held out for another two days. It had been reinforced by the veterans from the colony. Boudicca was not taking any prisoners. She was hell-bent on vengeance for the indignity she and her daughters had suffered. The inhabitants were all slaughtered. In traditional Roman fashion, Legio IX Hispana, led by Quintus Petilius Serialis, decided to immediately march towards the revolt to regain the initiative. Serialis was only able to call on the first cohort, possibly two others, the auxiliary infantry and a unit of some 500 cavalry, a force of perhaps 2,500 men, while Cassius Dio claims that Boudicca assembled her army to the number of some 120,000. Even if that number was embellished, the 9th Legion was heavily outnumbered. The Legion attempted to relieve the city, but arrived too late, and suffered an overwhelming defeat. Serialis fled to Gaul, along with the procurator of the province, Catus Decianus. With Camelodunum raised to the ground, Boudicca marched towards Londinium, one of the main trading ports of the province. When the news had reached Gaius Suetonius Paulinus, the governor of Roman Britain. He had started the long march to deal with the revolt himself, but he decided against attacking Boudicca immediately, leaving the inhabitants of Londinium to their own fates, though many inhabitants managed to flee before the settlement was ferociously laid to waste. Suetonius was hesitant due to the enormous force Boudicca had assembled and the fatal rashness of Serialis. He decided instead to reinforce his army before attacking Boudicca head-on. The 14th Legion, with the veterans of the 20th and the auxiliaries from the adjacent stations, joined Suetonius. Legio II Augusta, stationed in the southwest, refused to join Suetonius's call to arms. The legion was held back by its praefectus castrorum, or camp prefect, Poenius Postumus. Poenius cited his reason as wanting to hold ground 
in case the Britons turned west. Meanwhile, Londinium had been ravished by Boudicca, who now advanced towards Verulamium. Verulamium was a native town. Britons, who were allies of Rome, were constructing the city on the Roman model. Upon arrival, the rebels burned the city to the ground. Without the reinforcements from the Second Legion, Suetonius's army amounted to little less than 10,000 men. While our sources claim that Boudicca had amassed an army of around 200,000 at this time, because of this enormous discrepancy in numbers, Suetonius found a defensive spot to meet the Britons in a pitched battle. Tacitus writes, For this purpose, he chose a spot encircled with woods, narrow at the entrance, and sheltered in the rear by a thick forest. In that situation, he had no fear of an ambush. The enemy, he knew, had no approach but in front. An open plain lay before him. This location minimised Boudicca's one advantage over the Romans, her numbers. Her army lacked organisation, and can more be likened to an armed mob than a proper army. The precise location of this battle has never been discovered, but it is believed to have been somewhere in the West Midlands. Suetonius drew his men up in battle formation. The legions in close array formed the centre. The light-armed troops were stationed at hand to serve as occasion may require. The cavalry took post on the wings. Tacitus writes, The Britons brought into the field an incredible multitude. They formed no regular line of battle. Detached parties and loose battalions displayed their numbers, in frantic transport bounding with exultation, and so sure of victory that they placed their wives in wagons at the extremity of the plain, where they might survey the scene of action and behold the wonders of British valour. Boudicca in a chariot, with her two daughters before her, drove through the ranks. She harangued the different nations in their turn. This, she said, is not the first time that the Britons have been led to battle by a woman, but now she did not come to boast the pride of a long line of ancestry, nor even to recover her kingdom and the plundered wealth of her family. She took the field, like the meanest among them, to assert the cause of public liberty and to seek revenge for her body seamed with ignominious stripes and her two daughters infamously ravished. This is what Boudicca said to her troops. Behold the proud display of warlike spirits, and consider the motives for which we draw the avenging sword. On this spot we must either conquer or die with glory. There is no alternative. Tacitus reports Suetonius's speech to his men before the battle. Despise, Suetonius said, the savage uproar, the yells and shouts of undisciplined barbarians. In that mixed multitude, the women outnumber the men. Void of spirit, unprovided with arms, they are not soldiers who come to offer battle. They are bastards, runaways, the refuse of your swords, who have often fled before you and will again betake themselves to flight when they see the conqueror flaming in the ranks of war. In all engagements, it is the valour of a few that turns the fortune of the day. It will be your immortal glory that with a scanty number you can equal the exploits of a great and powerful army. Keep your ranks, discharge your javelins, rush forward to a close attack, bear down all with your bucklers, and hew a passage with your swords. Pursue the vanquished, and never think of spoil and plunder. Conquer, and victory gives you everything. With those words, the armies approached each other. The Roman legions presented a close embodied line. The narrow defile of the landscape gave them shelter on the flanks from encirclement. The Britons were shouting and singing battle songs while the Romans remained silent and resolute until they came within a javelin's throw of the enemy. In that instant, the Romans discharged their javelins and rushed forward in the form of a wedge. The auxiliaries followed with equal fervour. The cavalry, at the same time, bore down upon the enemy and, with their pikes, overpowered all who dared to make a stand. Most of the advancing Britons were killed in the initial stages, and panic was beginning to spread through the Britons because of the speed of the Roman advance. With their superior discipline and equipment, the Romans cut down the rebels one by one, and finally, late in the day, the Romans prevailed. The Britons fled, but their wagons in the rear obstructed their passage, and a dreadful slaughter followed. The glory of the day was equal to the most splendid victory of ancient times. 
According to some writers, not less than 80,000 Britons were put to the sword. The Romans lost about 400 men, and the wounded did not exceed that number. Upon hearing of Suetonius's victory, Poenius Postumus, the camp prefect who didn't send the second Augusta to reinforce Suetonius, Poenius felt the disgrace of having, in disobedience to the orders of his general, robbed the soldiers under his command of their share in such a complete victory. Stung with remorse, he fell upon his sword and expired on the spot. Boudicca was said to have survived the battle and returned home to Iceni territory, where she poisoned herself. What happened to her two daughters is unknown. They're never mentioned again by our sources. Cassius Dio ends his account of Boudicca with the following words. The Britons mourned her deeply and gave her a costly burial. But feeling that now at least they were really defeated, they scattered to their homes. So much for affairs in Britain. Boudicca's tomb has never been discovered, but many legends surround its whereabouts. Some believe she was buried at Stonehenge. There is not a solid foundation for this, and the story is largely taken as a fable. There is very little information available about Iceni funerary rituals. Some tribes in Iron Age Britain place their dead in special places to be desiccated by the elements, rather than cremated or interred. If the Iceni followed this practice, then nothing would remain of the Queen, or perhaps she is buried in the birdlip grave. Londinium recovered quickly after the revolt. A letter from 62 AD, referring to a delivery of goods to be transported from Verulamium to London, indicates that the market at Londinium had been swiftly rebuilt after its destruction by the rebels. The Roman conquest of Britain continued in the following decades. Agricola launched his campaign into the Scottish Highlands in 83 AD. Be sure to check out our video on his campaign in Scotland. Boudicca's revolt remained forgotten throughout the Middle Ages, until the rediscovery of Tacitus's writings in the 16th century during the European Renaissance. The Victorians later reinvented Boudicca as a valiant upholder of British nationhood, and Queen Victoria came to be seen as Boudicca's namesake, as their names were identical in meaning. The most famous rendition of her from this period was the statue Boudicca and her daughters, designed by Thomas Thornycroft, installed at Westminster Bridge in London as an enduring symbol of British spirit and strength. Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the video. The sources used in this video can be found in the description below.